To monitor how much pressure is produced, the ECM relies on a fuel pressure sensor. The high pressure pump is serviceable only as an assembly. But as with any component, you need to perform a thorough diagnosis before deciding to install a replacement. We'll get into diagnosis later in the program. The pressure sensor we referred to is located on the common rail. By now, it's probably pretty obvious that the fuel line setup is quite a bit different than on the previous Cummins engine. So at this point, let's follow the lines from start to finish, beginning with those responsible for supplying the high pressure pump with fuel. The fuel supply line from the tank is connected to the transfer pump inlet hose. The transfer pump sends fuel to the filter and then onto the high pressure pump via a pump supply line. A high pressure line from the pump supplies the common rail with fuel. And high pressure lines from the common rail supply the injector connector tubes with fuel. Note that to avoid damaging components, you should always use a backup wrench when removing and installing the high pressure line at the injection pump outlet and where the high pressure lines attach to the connector tubes. In addition to the fuel supply and fuel injection lines we've just described, there are a number of lines that connect to a common return to route excess fuel back to the fuel tank. One of these lines routes excess fuel from the high pressure pump to a junction at the fuel filter housing. Also connected to the fuel return is a line from the cylinder head that routes excess fuel from the injectors. In addition, there is a line from the pressure limiting valve, which is a device aimed at preventing excessive pressure. A line from the fuel filter housing routes the excess fuel from these sources back to the tank. One thing to note in servicing return lines is that only one of the banjo bolts used in the lines has a check valve. The check valve is located at the cylinder head outlet. Be sure not to substitute another banjo bolt for the one in this location. In order to see the rest of the fuel system components, we first need to remove a few components from the top of the engine, beginning with the breather cover. An oil separator is located in the breather assembly. As the name implies, its job is to separate oil from the crankcase vapors and return it to the oil pan. A road draft tube still routes vapors from the crankcase, but with the addition of the oil separator, there is no oil collection bottle to be checked and emptied. Under the breather cover is the cylinder head cover, also referred to as the valve cover. Note the gasket located in the groove at the bottom of the cover. This gasket can be reused as long as it remains in place and is not damaged. You'll need to remove the cylinder head cover to service the fuel injectors and the fuel injector connector tubes. There are several items worth noting when it comes to injector service. As mentioned earlier, be sure to use a backup wrench whenever connecting or disconnecting a high pressure line from a high pressure connector tube. Also, be aware that there is a new tool used to remove the connector tubes, number 9015. These connector tubes are directional, and on reassembly, the locating balls on the tubes must engage grooves in the cylinder head. The injectors use an electromechanical design. Three pass-through connectors in the rocker lever housing are used to route wiring to the injector terminals. A couple of items are worth noting here concerning the terminals. First, up to 90 volts can be present at the terminals, so take care not to touch them any time the ignition is on. Second, the terminal nuts have a torque spec of 11 inch-pounds. Excessive torque could snap the terminal, and if that happens, you'll need to replace the injector. Injector removal and installation is another area where you'll need to pay strict attention to the service information. The exhaust rocker arm must be removed to remove injectors, and that means you'll need to reset valve lash after injector installation. A new essential special tool, number 9010, is now used to remove injectors. You'll need to temporarily remove a rocker lever housing bolt and screw the tool stud into the bolt hole. When removing the number six injector with the engine in the vehicle, you'll need to separate the stud from the rest of the tool and install it first, and then the rest of the tool. Once you've removed the injectors using the tool, another new special tool, number 9007, can be installed in place of injectors for compression and leak down testing. Injector installation is not simply the reverse of removal. Establishing the correct torque on the injector fasteners and the connector tube nut is critical. 
as is the torque on all fuel system components. To ensure a good seal, injector fastener tightening is done in three stages, and connector tube nut tightening is done in two, so be sure to follow the steps in the installation procedure. The sequence is summarized in this month's reference book. If you do need to replace fuel system components, or if you need to disconnect components for some other repair, remember the system is self-bleeding, and you should never loosen high pressure lines during engine operation. The HPCR fuel system develops extremely high pressure, which can cause injury or death. The valve train components on the HPCR Cummins diesel engine are similar to those you've seen on previous Cummins diesel engines. Replacement valve springs can be used on either the intake or exhaust valves, and there's no need to change exhaust valve springs when installing a Mopar accessory exhaust brake. You can still distinguish intake from exhaust valves by the dimple in the exhaust valve. There is one item related to valve train components that you need to be particularly careful with to prevent leaks, the rocker lever housing. Just as with the cylinder head cover, if the gasket falls out of the housing groove, the gasket must be replaced. And the housing must be lowered straight down onto the cylinder head during installation. The air intake and exhaust system components are for the most part similar to those used on previous engines. Attached to the intake manifold cover is an air intake heater operated by the engine control module. The intake manifold is integral with the cylinder head. The intercooler is similar to the one used on the previous engine. However, a new tool is now available to check the intercooler and related components for leaks. We'll discuss the tool in more detail later in the program. On the exhaust side, the exhaust manifold now uses two lock plates, which are not reusable. The turbocharger is also similar to those used on previous engines. The turbocharger wastegate is not adjustable. Just as with previous engines, customers can help keep turbochargers operating properly by following the recommendations for allowing turbo RPM and temperature to decrease before turning off the engine. These recommendations are located in the owner's manual and involve running the engine at idle for a period of time before shutting it down. Downstream of the turbocharger, engines that meet California emission specifications have something you're probably not used to seeing on a truck with a diesel engine, a catalytic converter. The converter is used to reduce the emission of oxides of nitrogen. Cylinder head sealing also has some new features worth noting. Cylinder head gaskets are available in four different thicknesses to accommodate piston protrusion. Two are used with new engines, and two more are used with remanufactured engines. The gasket thickness is indicated by the number of holes on the tab on the front of the gasket. Be sure to refer to the service information when selecting replacement head gaskets. Well, that does it for the front end, fuel system, and top end components. Next, we're going to look at the lower end components along with the lubrication and cooling systems. The lower end of the Cummins engine has also undergone some changes which affect service. The oil pan can still be removed with the engine in the truck. However, you will need to raise the engine and support it with the driveline support fixture number 8534 and two new essential special tools, number 8534-13 and number 8534-14. You can also use these tools when removing the camshaft with the engine still in the truck. After removing the oil pan, you'll notice the bolts that attach the stiffener plate to the bottom of the block. When installing this plate, note that one of the fasteners has a lower profile to clear the oil pump suction tube. Using one of the other fasteners in this location could damage the tube. The pistons used on the new Cummins engine have several features you need to be aware of. For one thing, the engine uses only one grade of piston. As mentioned earlier, head gaskets are available in different thicknesses to accommodate piston protrusion. Early build engines have machined rods, but these will change to a cracked cap design later on. And of course, it is extremely important not to mix the two types of rods. The last piston feature we need to discuss involves the lubrication system. Standard output engines continue to use saddle jets located in the upper main bearing saddles to spray the connecting rods in the pistons. In high output